Welcome to the new format for Great Lakes Church online and the Great Lakes Church podcast. Services now available on demand Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. Central. Announcements available at the beginning of each service. To skip to the talk, please refer to the timestamps in the description. Enjoy the service. My name is Tyler Classo. I'm the Racine student pastor. Uh, it was great to have you a part of our service today. Uh, if this is your first time with us today, uh, I want to encourage you to fill out one of our connection cards with as much information as you feel comfortable. Um, and if you do that, we have a free gift for you. It's a Great Lakes Church t-shirt. Uh, and uh, just our way of saying thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is not your first time. You've been here a while. Uh, this is also a great tool. The connection card is a great tool to connect with uh, our staff here at Great Lakes Church. So if you have a prayer request, uh, you got something going on, you need to update some information, um, go ahead and fill that out as well. And if you're joining us online, we have a connection card at greatlakeschurch.com for you to fill out and we'll just send a mystery gift right to your front door. Around here at Great Lakes Church, we have a lot of organizations that we love to partner with. One of those is Royal Family Kids. Uh, obviously, you know about the summer camp because we talk about that a lot and that happens during um, the summer. But when they're not doing summer camp, they have a mentor program that is taking place year round um, where we have people that volunteer from the church to just invest in the students' life that are part of Royal Family Kids. As a student pastor myself, I know that students need a consistent figure in their life to continually love them and show them support, um, but also kind of like teach them about Jesus and be that example to them. Uh, and that's what Royal Family Kids Mentoring Program does. They have consistent volunteers that just invest in the students' lives on a weekly basis, and we can see how it can make a difference in their lives over time. Hi, my name is Danella and I'm 16 years old and I went to RFK for seven years. I feel like growing up, consistency is what I needed. I needed a set schedule, I need to know what I'm doing, what I'm doing and why type of thing. I honestly remember just going there and being like kind of scared. I didn't know who anyone was really. I remember this one activity where we all like had to circle up. I think it was a get to know you activity. Just saying my name and like one thing I liked about camp so far or one thing that I wanted everyone to know about me. I honestly found that opening to know everyone that was there, it was like a, a safe place to forget everything that has ever happened. I forgot like everything outside of camp, like camp was like everything. It was camp or nothing. I graduated out of the program. I ended up getting asked to volunteer as a counselor helper, helping organize all the activities and directing the kids there and seeing all the smiles and stuff. So it was a really great opportunity for me. I love this little girl. How are you? How are you doing? Look at the smiley face on your cheek. Because life sometimes wasn't consistent like mine, um, I did have to move a little home to home type of situation just knowing that I could come back to camp with the same counselor and not have to start all over. I had connections that I would knew I would never forget and I could come back and continue that connection. It's just important to have those memories locked in your brain because when times get rough, you can always look back on life and be like, I had all those conversations, I had those memories, those connections. Having that experience has also opened my eyes because I'm a junior in high school now. I have to start looking at colleges and stuff. Maybe wanting to go into maybe social working. Are you going to be a part of camp for the coming year, do you think? Um, for sure. I'm definitely going back. That is like an automatic yes. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Man, we see Danella goes from being a part of our camp and a, and a 
student in her camp attending uh, one of the campers and then investing her life in giving back. And so uh, we've talked a lot about Royal Family Kids Camp over the years and our investment into children uh, in foster care. Uh, one of the things you may not realize is that we actually... Uh, in addition to a week-long camp, throughout the year, on a regular basis, every month, we have a, a mentoring club. And so uh, we invest resources and time in that. And I just want to say to those of you who give on a regular basis, to those of you who support our church and you uh, support the mission, thank you. It's stuff like this that we're able to do in making a difference uh, here, near, and far. So let me just pray for uh, those who are in foster care and those being impacted that God will continue to give us uh, wisdom and how to be uh, most effective in reaching uh, children. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the real burden that you have placed on our heart for children and for students all over uh, Southeast Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. Uh, specifically today, we pray for those in foster care. Uh, we pray that you would give us wisdom and insight on in how to create the best experiences, memorable experiences, and to communicate your love uh, in a way that is understandable and in a way that will be remembered for many, many years to come. We pray for sweet Danella. May your uh, spirit uh, be upon her, and may you use her in incredible ways everywhere she goes, including uh, as she invests her life back into kids at the very camp she was affected at. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several weeks ago, we launched a teaching series called My Story. And before we jump into that series, what I want to do is I want to make you aware of a very special Christmas service that we're offering at Great Lakes Church this year in addition to our regular Christmas services. And it's something that we are calling the Empty Chair Service. All right, now here's the deal. It is going to take place at our Kenosha campus on Thursday, December 8th at 6.30 p.m. Now, regardless of what campus you attend, you attend Racine campus, you attend Kenosha campus, you attend online, you watch, you listen, right? If you live in Southeast Wisconsin or Northern Illinois and you feel like this is something that would be meaningful to you, we invite you to participate, all right? So the empty chair service, what it is, is it's a service for those who have lost a loved one sometime over the past year or maybe even a couple of years. And so it's an opportunity for uh, grieving families to acknowledge, hey, we're going to have an empty chair at our table this Christmas, and um, we want to pause and remember the person we lost. And we've never done a service like this before, so we'll have a couple of songs, uh, we'll have a time of prayer, and I will give a hopeful message, and then at the end, we're actually going to light candles uh, as a way of remembering uh, the people we've lost. Now, if you haven't lost a loved one, um, and you say, but I know of someone who has, and I actually think that might benefit. It might be part of the healing process. Then go ahead and invite them. And if, it, if you feel it's appropriate, uh, sit with them and attend the service with them. All right, and the whole thing should last, I'm guessing, 45 minutes. Uh, typically at Christmas with our Kenosha campus, you have to reserve tickets because of limited seating. Uh, but for this specific service, no need, to, uh, uh, no need to reserve tickets. I'm just letting you know uh, that that service is happening again Thursday, December 8th, 6.30 p.m. So like I said a moment ago, uh, we're in this teaching series called My Story. And the premise of the series is that all of us have a life story. And our stories consist of the many different chapters that are written during uh, our entire life. All right, so throughout our life, chapters are being written, and then what happens is one day we die. And all the chapters of our life start adding up to tell one big story, and then that story is told in just 30 or 60 minutes at our funeral. So some of you know that my grandmother recently passed away, my mom's mom. Uh, her name was Edith Mercier, and she was 93 years old. All right, my grandma was by far one of my favorite people on this planet. And I guarantee you that all of my siblings, my cousins, right, our children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, all of them would say the same thing. Fun to be around, um, made people feel uh, special. She would attend events, she would attend games, she would just do what she could to show people she loved them. And, and actually, when we started Great Lakes Church, she had been a part of another church for several decades, but she uh, joined in right from the beginning. Well, she passed away three weeks ago, and so we had a celebration of her life. And that celebration uh, included two songs, multiple stories from the grandkids, some pictures that went along with the songs. My mom gave a eulogy, I gave a message, and the entire service lasted 45 minutes. 
Now just think about that, right? 93 years of life summarized in 45 minutes. And then the theme that was kind of surfaced unintentionally in the different stories that were shared and the different things that were presented, the theme of her life that was just surfaced over and over and over was just this word faithful. My grandma was faithful to her family uh, throughout her entire life. She kept her family together through her love. She hosted weekly gatherings, weekly dinners at her house for a very, very long time. Uh, she had holiday celebrations at her house, parties at her house, but loved keeping people together. She was faithful to her husband. When my grandfather was in his early 40s, he had a stroke that left him paralyzed on uh, the left side of his body, and that uh, was something he uh, had for the rest of his life. And um, as a result of the stroke, uh, it changed the family dynamics. He wasn't able to provide for the family in the way that he had, and so my grandma had to step up, and she had to be the provider. At that point, when he had the stroke, they had been married a couple decades, but for the next 40 years, uh, she stayed by his side. They were married for over 60 years. Uh, she was faithful to God. Now, she would never get on stage and give a message. She would never uh, sing on the music team, right? Uh, even if we wanted to do a video where she talks, she, she would not want to do something like that, but, but she was faithful. She was a faithful part of uh, faith community her whole life. She gave faithfully and served faithfully. She welcomed people. Uh, for several years at Great Lakes, she was on the coffee team, and uh, she would arrive early, and she would, this was back in the theater days, she would go and reserve her seat Right, put her stuff around it, then she would go serve, and she would make sure everybody knew that I was her grandkid, <laughs> which I love, man, because uh, my mom has gone to this church since we started. There's a lot of people that do not know uh, that she's my mother because she doesn't volunteer that information. People find out over time, right? But the word faithful is what captures the story of her life, and what we're trying to wrestle through is, what is the story of your life? What's the story of my life going to be? What's going to be shared at our funeral? Well, 2,000 years ago, the disciple Peter, he writes a couple of letters to followers of Jesus living in Asia Minor, which was part of the Roman Empire at the time. Peter is in Rome. He's writing to followers of Jesus uh, living in this area, uh, much of it part of modern-day Turkey. And the emperor of Rome was a guy named Nero, and Nero was on a mission to eradicate and eliminate Christianity. It was a relatively new movement uh, at the time, so people were skeptical of it. They had lots of questions. So Nero just did not like followers of Jesus. He encouraged and he personally participated in all types of hostility and harassment and persecution. Well, it's during this time uh, that the disciple Peter decides to write a couple of letters to remind these followers of Jesus who are on the receiving end of persecution that they have been chosen by God and they've been adopted into his family. And he says, because you are God's sons and you are God's daughters, here is how you should live. Here's what it means to be part of God's family. Here's what the unfolding story of your life should look like. He says, I want you to know, even though things are tough, it's possible that you can live in such a way that you experience peace in the midst of chaos, hope in the midst of despair. You can experience unity in the midst of division. You can... Uh, believe it or not, show respect to people who do not deserve it. And he says, I want you to know that the way you choose to live your life in the midst of difficulty has the power, it has the potential to have a lasting impact on others. Well, not long after sending his first letter, what, Paul, what Peter does is he writes a follow-up letter. And the follow-up letter has a different focus to it than the first letter. In his second letter, uh, Peter, what he does is challenges his readers to grow in their understanding of Jesus. And the reason that was the focus of his second letter is because Peter had a growing concern that there were people who were teaching things about Jesus that weren't true. And so he wrote to them, and here's what he says at the start of his letter. He says, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So Peter says, my hope for you, my prayer for you, my desire for you is that you grow in knowledge and understanding of who Jesus is. This makes sense because in the first century, just like today, people's view and their understanding of Jesus was shaped by all sorts of factors. It was shaped by culture. It was shaped by family and friends. It was shaped by the opinions of influential people. It was shaped by religious leaders. And so 
how people view Jesus was all over the map, right? There's some people who saw him as a good teacher, not, nothing more than that. There were other people who considered him to be a prophet. Some thought he was a revolutionary. There were others because of the influence that Jesus had with people. They saw him as a threat. They figured that someday he might uh, potentially gather this group of people who followed him and try to overthrow the Roman government. So as you can imagine, there was lots of confusion, lots of ambiguity over who Jesus was. And so Peter's hope for these first century readers was they would have more and more clarity and understanding and knowledge of who Jesus was. Now, the reason this is so important is because the more we understand the truth about something, the less vulnerable we are to lies, deception, and counterfeits. We live in a world where almost anything that exists can be faked, forged, or counterfeited. And so Peter wants to warn his readers. He says, if you're not careful, you're going to be misled, and you're going to fall prey to counterfeit belief systems and teachings and philosophies. Now, I'm guessing you don't think about this much, but everything that God does, Satan counterfeits. And I know that for some, right, the idea of Satan or the concept of the word even Satan, it just feels very outdated. I get that. Right? Every time Satan is talked about in our culture, it's like this joke. We, we picture a guy in a red suit with horns wearing a pitchfork. But it's important to know that throughout the scriptures, when Satan is talked about, he's described as the personification of evil. Right? He actually is portrayed as a real entity, someone who schemes and plans and strategizes on how to destroy lives. And so to put it simply, Satan is the enemy of God. Everything he, that, that God does, the enemy comes along and tries to counterfeit. He perverts it, twists it, distorts it. So God creates truth, the enemy distorts truth. God creates entertainment. The enemy comes around and tries to distort and pervert entertainment. God creates happiness. The enemy distorts and twists happiness and what it looks like. God creates sex. The enemy comes along and distorts sex. This is how it goes, right? One day, Satan wakes up and he's like, I want to create some animals. Sorry, God already created them. So all he can do is distort and pervert, which is why we have cats. But the enemy from the beginning, has distorted and perverted and twisted and altered and changed things. He counterfeits everything that God does and everything God is. But he doesn't do it in obvious ways, right? He's not walking around with a stamp that's a 666 and making his mark known. He's very, very careful in how he counterfeits. Which means, if we're going to recognize counterfeit teaching and lies about Jesus, then we need to have discernment. There's a famous preacher from the 1800s named Charles Spurgeon. And he's credited with this quote. He says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's actually knowing the difference between right and almost right. It's easy to know the difference between right and wrong. But it's difficult to know the difference between right and almost right. So there is a term that's becoming more and more common in our culture called deep fake. And it's a reference to a video of a person in which their face or their body and often their voice has been digitally altered in such a way that it appears to be someone else. As you can imagine, most of the time it's used in a malicious way or to spread false information, but sometimes it's just used in a fun, lighthearted way. All right, so this guy right here, his name is Miles Fisher. And people have told him for a long time, well, you look like Tom Cruise. He, he does a little bit. He looks like Tom Cruise, but of course, not exactly like Tom Cruise. Well, what happened is a guy by the name of Chris Oom pioneered some technology that used artificial intelligence to transpose Tom Cruise's face onto Miles Fisher. Here's a quick video of what that ended up looking like. I'm going to show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real thing. That's pretty impressive, right? You could make Tom Cruise say anything you want. Entire TikTok account dedicated to deepfake Tom Cruise. So discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. And so Peter, what he does is he writes this letter to followers of Jesus, and he says, my prayer for you is that you grow in your knowledge of Jesus. And then Peter goes on to talk about why this is so important. He says, 
I want you to know about Jesus. And he says, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like when he was here on this earth, right? We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. Peter says, the reason I am passionate about you knowing the real Jesus is not because somebody told me about him in a classroom and I want you to know about him. It's not because mom and dad told, told me about Jesus and what I was supposed to believe when I was a little kid. It's not because I heard a rumor at lunchtime, people are talking about Jesus, and so I made some assumptions, and I want you to know about Jesus. Peter says, the reason I'm passionate, the reason I want you to know the real Jesus is because I was an eyewitness to who Jesus was. I spent years of my life with him. I'm confident in him. And then Peter goes on to write, he says, I'm not just confident in who Jesus is, I'm confident in the Jewish scriptures and in the writings of the Jewish prophets, which is our Old Testament. He says this, he says, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Peter says, after spending years of my life with Jesus, listening to his teachings, after seeing how he interacted with people, after watching him die, he was buried, and then coming face to face with the resurrected Jesus a few days later, I want you to know, I am convinced that the Jewish scriptures pointed to Jesus. That's what they do, they point to him. And it's obvious that the manuscripts written by the Jewish prophets weren't written as fiction. They weren't written as hypothesis. They, these weren't just like guesses people were making. He says, I want you to know these authors were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then he writes this. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. Peter says, I have full confidence in God's ability to speak to people and through people. But just because somebody claims to speak on behalf of God doesn't make it true. And he uses two terms here, right? It says false prophets and false teachers, and he kind of uses them synonymously, but really they're two different terms. A false prophet is someone who claims to have new or special information from God. So they claim to have special insight from God, they uh, make predictions about the future, and they claim to know things other people don't know, and then when their predictions don't come true, they kind of justify and explain it away and kind of twist and turn things to keep people following them. Well, when I was growing up, there was a popular booklet that came out called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. It sold more than four and a half million copies. Now, the rapture is this idea that one day Jesus will return to earth and every follower of Jesus will be raptured into the air. We will send into heaven and meet Jesus in the air. And so the author of this book wasn't some crazy man, Edgar Wiseman. He wasn't some crazy guy. He was educated. He was a NASA uh, engineer. He was a Bible student. But here's what he said about his book when it came out. He says, only if the Bible is in error am I wrong. And I say that to every preacher in town. If there were a king in this country and I could gamble with my life, I would stake my life on it. Well, the rapture didn't take place. So I kid you not, he wrote another book. And apparently, the publishers did not want him to call it 89 reasons why Jesus will return, or the rapture will be in 1989. Uh, so instead, what he did is he called it the final shout. I actually have this. Right? It's called the rapture report. And he was like, hedging his bets. 1989, 1990, 91, 92. It goes all the way to 93. Anyone who claims to speak on behalf of God or makes claims that they have special insight and then those claims don't come true, they're a false prophet. That's why you need to be very, very, very careful using the phrase, God told me. Now, a false teacher is someone who takes information we do have about God and then they distort it. So they teach something that is contrary to the clear teachings of Scripture. And I say the clear teachings because the fact is there are a lot of things in the scripture that we're going to debate on because the Bible is unclear, right? Like the age of the earth. How old is the earth? Well, all we know is got a lot of birthday candles, right? Was the story of Jonah a literal story or was it kind of this poetic story to explain, uh, you know, kind of how God works? We could debate that stuff all day long. But false teachers are ones who contradict the clear teachings of scripture. Uh, the teachings that say, there is one God who reveals himself through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? That's just one example. I could give you a bunch, but uh, believe it or not, I actually have a friend who a few years ago started teaching the idea of multiple gods. It was a church like Great Lakes, 
right? They, they uh, had services like us. They uh, had similar beliefs to us. But then he just started teaching this. And during their services, they started doing weird things like reading from uh, what Muhammad said or what the Buddha said. It was just kind of all these different approaches. Right? That would be called false teaching. And it's nothing new. At the time Peter is writing this letter, there's a growing movement called Gnosticism. And it comes from a Greek word that means knowledge. And one of the teachings of Gnosticism was that although Jesus appeared to be human, it was more or less an illusion. His crucifixion, an illusion. His resurrection, an illusion. And so Peter warns his readers. He says, listen, you have to be on the lookout for false prophets and false teachers. The problem is that false prophets and teachers disguise themselves as pastors and Bible teachers and devoted followers of Jesus, right? They appear to believe all the right things about God. They spend time with other followers of Jesus. They seem to love God, but they lead people astray. The apostle Paul, in one of his first century letters, he actually describes false prophets and teachers this way. He says, they are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan likes to camouflage. Right? He knows how to blend in. He knows how to deceive. And the most common way that Satan disguises himself is with truth. Not complete truth, but close to the truth. And if we don't know what we're looking for, we are going to be deceived. So Peter writes, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. And then he says, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. Reference to Jesus. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. He says they're going to teach destructive heresies. It's not a word we use every day, right? A heresy is when someone rejects, denies, or opposes who Jesus is, or any of the foundational teachings of the Christian faith. So Peter says that kind of teaching is destructive. It causes havoc. It divides and misleads people. It causes people to be insecure about where they stand with God. It causes people to question uh, where, where, where they are with God. And here's what he goes on to say. He says, many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. Now, it's very easy for us to disconnect ourselves from Peter's words because, come on, he wrote this stuff 2,000 years ago. We're living in a completely different world. But let me ask you, do you think this stuff still happens? Yeah. Do you think there's still false teachers, false prophets? Do you think there are things that are taught today that lead people down a destructive path? Well, of course there are. So what do we do about it? Well, there's two things we can do about it. There's two ways that we can protect ourselves from deception. The first is this, stay alert. To be alert means to be on the lookout. It's a very proactive thing. So after uh, we were attacked on Pearl Harbor, right, 1941, more than 15,000 watchtowers were built along the coastlines of the United States. And they were manned by individuals who had nothing more than binoculars and a telephone. And so they had to call the Coast Guard if there was any incoming threats. Most of us cannot relate to living in that kind of world. Right? We don't live with that kind of threat. My wife and I, when we go to bed at night, it's not like, well, let's one of us stay up and just make sure that uh, any potential threats are, are dealt with. No, we don't do that. What do we do? We just lock the door and go to bed. The only way that either of us would ever stay up and maybe take turns looking out is if we knew that there was danger. Well, the disciple Peter in his first letter actually writes this. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I would stay alert if I had an enemy. Peter says, oh, you do have an enemy. You've got an enemy and that enemy is Satan. And he's prowling around looking for someone to devour. Guys, it's so easy to forget this. Because when we think of like Satan and we think of this kind of stuff, man, it feels like fantasy and fiction. And, but this is how the enemy works. He wants us to think that way. Right? He doesn't make himself obvious. 
And so I just want you to know that your family has an enemy. And your marriage has an enemy. And you have an enemy. Your children have an enemy. Our church has an enemy. If you're in a group, that group has an enemy. And what the enemy wants to do is devour and divide and wreck faith and destroy relationships. And so Peter says, you need to stay alert. Now, I don't want to be too ambiguous about uh, this, the stuff that we're talking about. And so what I did is I wrote down some things that personally I have to do uh, to pay attention to in my own life because these are things that, quite honestly, make me vulnerable to following lies and deception. So in order for me to stay alert, I need to pay attention to things like this, indifference. Right? When I just grow indifferent to things that are happening in people's lives or in our world or in my own life, cynicism, right? it kind of makes its way into my heart and I start getting very, very cynical about things I see in the world. You know, when you've seen a lot and you've heard a lot, you just kind of approach the world differently, right? Uh, compromise, um, that's a big one uh, where it's like, man, I, I know that that's wrong, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to kind of inch towards the line. Uh, disconnectedness from others. Or just when I, when I see myself getting more and more disconnected, I'm not talking about uh, solitude. We all need that. I'm talking about like isolating ourselves from others. That's a, that's a big deal. Burnout, emptiness, uh, hurt, like that's unresolved and keeps piling up. Because here's the deal. And this, we could just add to this list all day long, but if, if things like this grow, what happens is we become more and more vulnerable to temptation and to various things that have the potential to lead us away from the faith. So Peter says, stay alert. He knows that when we are on the receiving end of hostility and persecution, it's easy to grow indifferent, right? It's easy to just wonder, well, why am I even following Jesus? It just doesn't even seem like he's real. It doesn't seem like God's out there protecting anybody. It's easy to become cynical. Why is it that those who are rejecting God seem to be getting ahead, but I'm the one who's suffering? It's easy to compromise because we look for relief and pleasure and ways to enjoy life. It's easy to become isolated and burned out and empty inside and hurts start piling up. Stay alert. And I would say this is especially important in the areas we know that we are the most vulnerable. I have several friends who have software on their phones and computers that send alerts to trusted family and friends if they go to pornographic websites. Oh my gosh, so archaic. It sounds so ridiculous. But they do it because they want their spouse to be their standard of beauty. And so they're staying alert and they're being proactive. I have friends who never drink alcohol. Now Jesus never said, don't drink alcohol, but they made that decision for themselves. And sometimes it's because they just don't want to drink. Right? They don't like how it tastes. Uh, they obviously haven't had the right stuff. They, they don't like how it tastes. They, they, no, they, they, they don't uh, maybe like how it makes them feel or just have no interest, whatever. But often people will say, I don't drink because I watched it destroy a chapter or two in my own life. Or I have a family member and it destroyed a chapter or two in their life. And so I'm protecting myself in the area I feel vulnerable. For me personally, one of the areas that I have to work at staying alert is cynicism. And so I just got to tell you, there are several people that I hide on social media. We're still friends. So they know we're friends. They just don't know. I don't see their posts. Why? Because they're too negative. And when I get in and see their stuff, it just fuels cynicism inside of me. Guys, it would benefit all of us to stay alert for, uh, to the different forms of media that we allow in our minds and hearts. Social media, books, movies, uh, different shows, because those things have the power to desensitize us. And again, I know, I'm, I'm realistic. This sounds ridiculous. It sounds like rules and legalism and just, it's it just, it's ridiculous. But guys, it's because we live in a world that constantly baits us to the line, morally and ethically, just keeps baiting us to the line. But then the moment we cross over, they mock us. They bait us to the moral line, ethical line, and then mock us when we cross over. Stay alert. There is an enemy who wants to destroy your faith. The second thing we need to do is be on guard. Now, there's a slight difference between staying alert and being on guard, right? Staying alert is actively being on the lookout, looking for trouble, warning signs, and trying to be proactive and keeping threats at bay. 
to be on guard is to actively resist trouble when it comes, right? So that trouble is standing in front of me and now I'm in charge. I'm on guard and I have to ensure this thing does not get past me. At the end of his second letter, here's what Peter writes. He says, so be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. The apostle Paul actually echoes what Peter writes. In one of Paul's first century letters, he addresses church leaders and he says this. He says, guard yourselves and God's people. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now that is intense language. Vicious wolves, not sparing the flock. What are these vicious wolves going to do? I mean, who is he even talking about? Well, what do we need to be watching out for, Paul? Well, thankfully, he answers that question. He says, even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. So watch out. Now, I got to tell you, I, I look at those words, and I'm like, phew. I thought it was going to be a lot worse than that, right? I mean, savage wolves. I'm thinking of people who, who take advantage of widows. I'm thinking of people who steal money from the church. I'm thinking he's talking about pastors having affairs. I'm thinking he's talking about people who kidnap kids. Vicious wolves. I'm thinking he's talking about bear fans. That's what I'm thinking about, but distorting the truth. I mean, it sounds very savage, doesn't it? Come on, if you've ever been to Millennial Park, uh, Millennium Park down in Chicago, you probably stood below the bean and seen your reflection before, right? It's a very distorted image of yourself. It looks odd, a little strange, but come on. It is not dangerous or destructive. But the reality is that distortions of the truth destroy our lives all the time. Distorted truth leads people away from the faith all the time. Now, I had written out a bunch of ways that the truth gets distorted, but it was so important that I'm like, I just can't pack it in to the same talk I'm talking about all this stuff. So I'm actually going to talk much more in detail about the distortion of truth next week. But let me just give you one example of what I'm talking about when I talk about the distortion of truth, because there's different ways it gets distorted, right? The distortion of grace is one of the ways that the enemy distorts truth. The disciple Peter, very clear in his letters that everything about our faith hinges on Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. It is all about Jesus. It is all because of Jesus. It is all through Jesus, and it is all for Jesus. The way that we are made right with God is by opening our hearts, putting our faith, our trust, our confidence in who Jesus is and everything Jesus did on the cross, not putting any confidence, any trust in ourselves. But what happens is that people in every generation step up and they distort grace. They th say things like, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you have some sort of faith because all paths eventually lead to God. What really matters is, is you have faith of some kind. Well, that's the distortion of the truth. Jesus made this very clear in a proclamation that he made. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So when someone talks about multiple paths to God and believing whatever you want to believe, I got to tell you, that is a distortion of grace. It's a distortion of truth. Another way that grace is often distorted is when we put more emphasis on what we can do for Jesus rather than on what Jesus has done for us. It happens all the time. And Peter says, be on guard. Well, how do we do that? We do that by becoming more and more familiar with the truth, which is Jesus. So we know what we're looking for. I say this all the time. I am a broken record. Ultimately, everything in the scriptures point to Jesus. The scriptures are not fundamentally about us, our life, our improvement, our faithfulness, our commitment, our devotion, our morality. The focus of the scriptures is not about us and our work for God. It is on God's work for us. The scriptures, which is our Bible, right? It's not a book about good people making their way up to God. It is a collection of 66 books that communicate the message of a great God making his way down to us, to bad and broken and guilty people. 
And instead of demanding sacrifices from us to be okay with God, he became a sacrifice for us, which is Jesus on the cross. This is why we refer to what we teach week after week after week as the gospel. Because the gospel means good news. Everything Jesus taught, everything Jesus represents, everything Jesus is, is good news. So next week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk much more about the different ways that truth gets distorted, and I hope that you're going to join us. But ultimately, my prayer for all of us, and the reason we're doing this series, is that we would get to the end of our lives, and that the story that's told about us is that in the good times and in the bad times, when things were fun and when things were not fun, is that we held on to our faith and that we were faithful. Faithful to our family, faithful to our spouses, but most importantly, faithful to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your grace. We thank you that you are a great God who made your way down to this planet. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand and to know and to comprehend you more and more and more. May we have more and more clarity about who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do so that we can stay alert and be on guard in a much more effective way and not fall prey and fall trap to false teaching and uh, ridiculous uh, messages that seem to surface in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can hang out with us every day at greatlakeschurch.com, the Great Lakes Church app, or on socials at Great Lakes Church. We'll see you next time.